Hello everybody, welcome to a special um, one-off, one-hour PGR theme question time uh, webinar today. Um, I'm Daryl Butcher from the Graduate Research School. Um, this is a special Q&A session that the Graduate Research School has led in partnership with the GSA to try and find a moment to take your questions, listen to your thoughts and try and help answer and respond to, the, to you on the issues that matter. We obviously understand that the coronavirus pandemic has created a lot of issues affecting research students. And that's why we're hosting this session today. We have a number of panelists who are gonna try and answer as many questions as possible over the next hour. If we're unable to cover all questions, I would say, oh, this is live. So I would say things may go wrong. So just bear with us, it's an experiment. So ignore that for a second. Okay, so the panel today, uh, I'll introduce them shortly. We're going to try and answer as many questions as we can that we received from you the last few days. If we don't get the chance to answer them, we will make those questions available on the York Graduate Research School blog, also available on the GSA website. We do hope, of course, we answer as many as we can. They will, following this, be a Q&A session from the sabbatical officers at the GSA, as part of the regular series of Q and A's that they are doing on key issues that you face right now. I would say for one second, here as representative of the GSA, if there are issues that you feel passionately about that may not be addressed today, or that aren't being addressed in the wider scheme of things, then I would urge you of course to contact our sabbatical officers. I'm putting in a shameless plug here for the GSA, we do have our GSA elections right now, and I would urge any of you who feel very passionately about some of these issues to contact us before tomorrow and feel free to have a go at nominating yourself for election, but more of those details later. So for today, obviously, as I say, this is an experiment. The format is going to run like this. Um, we're going to run out, list out a number of questions. The panelists from both the Graduate Research School and the GSA will answer as best as we can and then we'll come back to you, the, the student who's answered that question, or I might be reading out a question on their behalf. So before we begin, I'd just like to introduce you to the panelists here today. Panelists, please go ahead. Hello there, everyone. Nice to see you're all here. Um, my name's Tom Stoneham, and I'm Dean of the Graduate Research School at York. And um, that means uh, I have oversight of all, all aspects of your uh, experience here at York. And there are two and a half, nearly two and a half thousand of you. So um, it's a big and complex community of PhD students and uh, masters by research students and a few MPhil students. And hopefully uh, we are able to, to address your needs um, as, well as, we, as well as is realistically possible. So looking forward to the questions. I think Karen, over to you. Hello there, my name is Karen Clegg um, and I am head of the Research Excellence Training Team. And what that means is that as well as providing training and professional development and career opportunities for you, um, at the moment I'm also taking great pride um, in being able to work with colleagues across the university in looking at engagement and community and how we look after you um, in this particularly troubling time. Uh, Christine. Hi, I'm uh, Christine Comrie. I'm a content producer within marketing. I work with um, Tom Stoneham to do the blog and various other bits of content like the web, the newsletter that you get as well. Okay, thank you for that. And from the GSA side, Perna, do you want to go ahead? Um, I think she do, but I think that we also have Juliet James. Would you like to give her a chance to introduce herself? Oh, I herself. beg your pardon, Juliet. It's, it's live, of course, these things happen. Please go ahead, Juliet. Thank you, Perna. Hi, um, I'm Juliet James. I work in the academic quality team in the university's academic support office. And I'm here because I work on um, policy as it relates to postgraduate research students and their programmes. Okay, so going back to the GSA side, Perna, would you like to go ahead? Thank you, Daryl. Hello, everyone. I am uh, Purn Raltai. I am the GSA president. I'm happy to answer some of the questions coming from you today. Thank you for submitting them in the first place. 
Uh, Clara, or even uh, Jane. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm the Wolfing on um, community. Um, I'm community officer at the GSA, and I'm really happy to be here at the panel today. And finally, Jane. Hello, um, I'm Jane Baston. I'm the Vice President Academic at the GSA. Um, very excited to be here and answer all of your questions. Okay, so without further ado, uh, thank you, panelists. We're going to go to our first question, which we've received um, from a student who I'm going to read out on behalf of. Uh, one of the common themes that we're hearing about is why are we shutting the campus? COVID-19 obviously presents significantly less risk, according to this question, to people in the typical age range of postgraduate students than the likes of car accidents, home accidents, food poisoning, drowning, and a whole manner of everyday risks. Given this, why have you taken the draconian measure of shutting out labs and ruining our future careers based on the danger which is of no significance to us. Obviously, a passion question. Um, I'm going to go to Karen in the first instance, please. Karen, would you like to respond? Um, thanks for your question. Um, and, and realise where it, that it's heartfelt. I want to reassure all of you that your health, your safety, and your security are first. As a university, we have a duty of care to you and your families and everybody that you come into contact with. And when this pandemic struck, we, like every other university, had to act in the very best interest of you. Um, and this could come across as patronising, but I really don't want it to. We had to think quickly. We had to think in your best interest and in the interest of everybody else. And closing the campus and minimising any potential spread and any risk to health had to be our first priority. And so the decision was taken to move all non-essential staff to working from home as, as quickly as possible um, and to make sure that there was a risk register for anybody who did have to go onto campus. So for example, you know, there are still animals in, in labs that have to be tended for and cared for. Um, and so there's a register of people can, who can go and do those kind of activities. Similarly, those students for whom it was no choice to stay on campus um, are being catered for um, and I know people have drawn references to, you know, to the grounds being maintained, but actually where distancing can take place, then we have to put in place the measures that will mean we can have a swift return to campus in a safe and organised fashion when the government and, and all the governments of all the students who will be coming back as international students back to campus. So it wasn't lighthearted. We don't think it's overly draconian. It was simply to make sure um, that you are protected and that your families are protected. Um, and in all sincerity, you know, you are the researchers, you are the future, you are doing phenomenal work to make sure um, that society functions. And so, you know, we have to invest in you and investing in you at the moment means closing down and opening up as many online opportunities um, as we can. And I may have a chance to say a little bit more about that later, um, but be rest assured it, it, it was your security that, that we have in mind um, and will continue to do so. Can I make a comment about opening up, uh, Daryl? Yeah, please do. So um, I just want to reassure everyone that we are going through the process of planning for when we're able to reopen the campus. So there's a research contingency group which is planning uh, the phased reopening of um, research facilities including labs um, as and when the government's uh, lockdown starts easing. Now I can reassure you that I sit on that, that group to represent the interests of postgraduate researchers and um, at the meeting on Monday I, I asked the group um, to agree and they did unanimously that in all decisions about access to research facilities whether reopening labs or if there's a further second wave and we have to have a further lockdown closing things again in all those decisions we want our postgraduate researchers to be treated just like research staff so you will get exactly the same level of access as any other researcher 
Um, so we, we're not um, treating you in any way differently when it comes to the access to those facilities. So rest assured that that's uh, a decision that's been made. Um, on this issue, um, would any of the GSA representatives like to comment on this? Yeah, thank you, Darrell. I'd like to make a comment. Um, I think as Karen and Tom has um, said, uh, we need to be following guidelines from the experts and, and government. And I believe the lockdown measures are for everyone's uh, safety and not only your own. And we need to be thinking not only as individuals, but, uh, but as, a, as a whole community and as a whole society right now. Um, but I will also want to acknowledge that it is difficult for those students whose research depend on being physically on campus. Uh, I know we've been receiving a lot of comments on the students getting um, their research paused because they don't have access to the library, the archives or, or laboratories. So I believe that the university, uh, and I'm sure they are going to be doing it, uh, will be making provisions to take students whose research has been affected into account. Um, and I think also that we need to be considering that some of those students cannot afford to take um, extensions. So. Thank you, Clara. Um, obviously a subject that we could probably spend the whole hour uh, discussing and a difficult one to, um, a dif difficult challenge, of course. Um, obviously we're short of time. So moving on to our second question today, um, it's on the um, theme of funding. We're getting lots of students at the GSA, of course, regularly contacting all our SAVs. Um, the question um, today is going to be um, a live, live question read out by Katie Valentine on the theme of who will receive additional funding. Katie, would you like to go ahead, please? Hi, uh, yeah. Um, so I think a lot of us have this question. After the Vice Chancellor sent out the email the other week about um, all PhD students having up to six months funded extension, um, we'd just like a bit more clarity on what that funded word actually means, whether this would include our normal stipend that we get paid or whether that just means that we don't have to pay the university fees and the continuation fees. And then also how that would tie into our other funding bodies like NERC and the UK RI and stuff. Excellent. Thank you, Katie. Um, yes, we're, we're working really, really fast in this area to try to, to roll out this process. So I'm sorry that there's still some unclarity. Um, let me kind of explain as much as I can now briefly about what the scheme is. Um, so what, what the university's executive board agreed to do was to look at the scheme being uh, arranged by UKRI, UK Research and Innovation, which is the uh, one of the overarching bodies that um, controls research councils who fund a lot of PhD students. And that scheme actually was only announced on the 20, the details were only announced on the 24th of April to us. So what we decided is that we wanted all PhD students at York where we're responsible for their funding. So that could be either they're paid out of university funds or we have acquired the funding from a research council or a charity or another research funder uh, for them for their PhD and we wanted them to be treated on the same terms as the UKRI students. What are those terms? Well the UKRI terms are for anyone whose funding comes to an end between the 1st of April 2020 and the 31st of March 2021 they will be eligible for up to six months uh, extension to their funding and on um, insofar as they've been affected by the by the pandemic what that funding extension means is that there any any fee any tuition fees um, will be paid and also their stipends will be continued for that period so it's fees and stipends it's not RTSG it's not the allowance for consumables uh, it's just fees and stipend uh, in that group. So that's what we're doing. We're following that. In terms of process, if you're funded through a DTP or a CDT, they will contact you and they will run that process and they have to do it very quickly because UKRI have asked them to return that information on the 29th of March. If you're not funded through 
uh, a CDT or a DTP, if you're funded through some other mechanism within the university, we will be uh, running the process through your department and your department will contact you once we've established who's eligible and um, then they will uh, complete the process with you. So that's, that's where we are at the moment. Um, um, but it's moving very fast. Um, thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, I'm very aware of the GSA. This is an issue that the GSA have been lobbying quite hard on, having received many inquiries with students. So I'm going to pass this over to Clara. Clara, would you like to uh, make some further comment, please? Yeah, thank you. I think, uh, well, I, we welcome that the university has followed other student bo uh, funding bodies uh, into extending their funding. Um, I think, uh, but I think we, as I've said before, we also need to acknowledge that there are students that cannot afford to overstay in their studies. So uh, asking for extensions, uh, implying following arrangements that can cause distress to them. So like uh, they have issues with their visas, with their rent contracts, with uh, they have other opportunities uh, uh, awaiting for them when they end their studies. So what would you what would you say to those students that cannot afford um, to ask for extensions into the research? This, this is a, a, a huge um, problem that's been thrown into relief uh, by, by the current pandemic, that PhD students, their, finan their means of financial support are very, very varied. There's lots and lots of different ones. And we are fully aware that a lot of uh, students who are funding themselves through loans or savings or some other similar sort of mechanism have funding set up for a fixed period of time expecting to complete their PhD in that time and they may need longer to complete their PhD and I think we've got questions coming about extending deadlines. Um, so those ones are going to be in particularly difficult situations um, and we're currently trying to work out what we can do by way of helping them um, and it, there's no simple answer and um, I'm uh, currently working with um, the university's fundraising uh, bodies to see if we can find some way of raising funds which would be able to support uh, students in those situations. But as you know, there's a huge economic downturn. Universities are hard up. It's hard to find people with spare money at the moment, but we'd very much like to be able to find some support for them. Thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, as we can see, obviously funding is a big part of concerns for students right now. So in that vein, our next question is another aspect of funding around the issue of self-funded students and the question of additional financial support. The question comes from a student I read on their behalf. It's what assistance, if any, is available for self-funded students? The emergency student fund is amazing, but can't really be applied for tuition or extensions with PhDs. Is there any support available for these purposes? And I think we're gonna to go to you, Juliet, to have a go at responding to this one, please. Yes, I would say this isn't, isn't my area, so please bear with me on this. Um, we certainly recognise that for self-funded students, this is a, a particularly hard time. Um, and you don't have access if you're self-funded to some of the safety nets that funded students do. Um, and the university is very, very aware of that. Um, in terms of tuition fee, what we'd say is that if you are having concerns about your tuition fees, if you're worried about paying them, then we'd ask you to get in touch with the fees office as soon as possible to talk about the options. And they will be sympathetic and talk with you about what might be possible. So, for example, spreading out the payments um, and, and other alternatives. So, so that, that will be our first point is please speak to the fees office about, about your tuition fees. Um, as the question has, uh, has pointed out, there are um, actually a number of um, funds available um, for students um, who are struggling financially, even though they can't be used for tuition fees. Uh, we're really pleased that students highlighted the emergency student fund, which has been set up um, especially in, in the light of the current situation um, and it's worth noting that the the next round um, of funding closes um, on the on Wednesday the 13th of May 
so if you are if you're interested in applying to that then do bear that in mind um, there are also um, another of a number of other funds um, there's a student support fund which is a, a sort of ongoing hardship fund um, for students um, and in the past there was a, a limit to the amount of funding that was available for PGR students in their continuation period but the rules around that have been relaxed in the light of the current situation so there's now more assistance available for students who are in their continuation period so that might be worth having a look at if that um, if that situation applies to you um, there's also an emergency loan fund and an IT equipment loan fund and all the details are available on the student finance web pages I think the main one of the other main points though is that everyone's situation is different and if you are struggling financially you need to get advice for your own personal situation and therefore you know what we really say is get in touch as soon as possible with the student advisors in the student hub and they can talk to you they can talk you through the options available and hopefully find a way forward that, that works for you and, and reassures you in, in these really difficult times okay thank you for that um we're getting a lot of um additional questions to the responses so far i would say to anybody out there if you can just bear with us we will try and come back to as many points that you've raised as we can um, i'm going to carry on with the vein of funding questions for now uh, the next funding question is uh, around final year only funding extensions it's a question that uh, we've submitted we've been submitted by uh, joe nabarro if you would like to um, read out your question please joe yeah can you hear me hello yeah, can you, joe. yeah i can hear you please go ahead Hi. okay so I'm a first year UKRI funded PhD student on a laboratory based project. Um, the university's decision to suspend research and close the university completely um, continues to essentially completely impede any progress that I can make because I don't have access to the specialist equipment that's fundamental to my project. Um, will I and other PhD students like me who require specialist university facilities um, for their research be eligible for any of the university's funding extension programs um, as alluded to by the email sent by the vice chancellor on the 29th of April. Um, um, I think I better address that. that one, Tom. Um, thanks Joe. Um, so currently at the moment we're, we're, we're tracking what UKRI is doing and their their view on students who are not at the end of their coming up to the end of their funded period is that this needs to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis when when the issues have become apparent I mean I think the reason uh, they're saying that and it also applies to us is there is just so much uncertainty at the moment about what is going to happen over the next year, and also about the future uh, structure of research activities and research funding. This pandemic is changing a lot, and all research around the world has been interrupted. I and mean, it's a global phenomenon. You know, we talked earlier about closing the university. Uh, pretty much every university in the world has been closed for some period uh, during this. And the interruptions to research are huge and we need to actually understand what they have been before we know what the appropriate response is. So the answer is there's still uncertainty. Um, no one's ruling out anything, but we'll try to deal with it uh, once, we've, once we've dealt with the, the short term issues. We'll try to look at the longer term issues. So in your particular case, your first year, you need access to specialist equipment. You're not able to do that. You're presumably keeping in touch with your supervisor and you're keeping on top of other things that you can be doing. It's still an impact on your research plans. We need to understand all of that uh, once we've got through this pandemic and we can see the global impact uh, and the, the total picture. Then we can make those decisions. Sorry, uh, muted there. Joe, uh, do you have any further comment to make in response? No, I, well, I just, I don't, I mean, if, you sh if you've made a decision to close the university and the university's owned that decision, as, as, as you know, you've, you've expressed, and I completely understand why, 
I just don't quite understand why you would then wouldn't take responsibility for funding the, you know, for, for taking financial responsibility for the disruption that you've caused as a result of that closure. I don't understand why we as students and our research has to it essentially is, it, you know, is, is potentially going to, we're going to have to take personal responsibility for that decision that we had no part to make. I mean, I, I understand uh, that, but nor did uh, all the research, other researchers at the university have any part in making that decision. The decision was made by the university's executive board on the basis of the interests of all staff and students over the totals uh, well over 20,000 people. Now, we know there's an impact on you. We know there's an impact on all our research. <laughs> you know, it's it, all, all the labs, all the facilities are closed except those that are uh, actively engaged in COVID-19 related research. And there's quite a few of those, uh, I'm pleased to say. But um, what we have to do is we have to find out what that impact is before we can decide what to do about it. We also have to know how the government and the research funders are going to, to respond as well. And at the moment, they're not giving us any clear indication about what the situation will be next year. So we just, we're just scenario planning, waiting, seeing what we can do. Um, it's, a, it's a very nervous time for all universities. Um, I don't know how much you follow the higher education press, but uh, all university, UK universities are facing a major financial crisis and the government has declined to help them out at the moment. So um, there's lots of things up in the air that we have to work out how to deal with, but you're not being forgotten. We're just waiting till we've got more information. Um, for the sake of time today, Joe, we have to leave that there, but if there's any further follow up you'd like to take and to discuss this in more detail, then please separately feel free to contact one of our sabbatical representatives here today at the GSA separately. Um, but I, I have to move on to the next question now. Um, um, Daryl. Oh, sorry, Perna, you want to go ahead? Can I, can I just ask a follow-up question? So it's yeah. um, really positive to see, um, like, uh, there are some work going on for home um, and EU students in, in that case. But um, I think it's also reflected in questions uh, submitted live that what is happening, like what the university is doing to approach international funding bodies? Let me, let me say something about that. Yes, so quite a lot of our, our uh, PhD students are funded by international, overseas, you know, international organizations. Um, they're funded directly. So we, we have a, a slightly distant relationship with them, but we do have a relationship with them. So we're currently contacting all of them and keeping an eye on what they're doing. We're explaining what is being done for UK students and encouraging them to think in the same way. Um, our general experience so far is that most of them have not got to that stage in their thinking and planning. Um, so they've not been able to share anything with us, but we remain engaged with them and we remain using as the, the main leverage that UK students are being treated in a certain way. So, so we would hope that you would uh, also do this. Uh, but apart from lobbying, our, our influence is limited, I'm afraid. But we are in, we are in touch with them. Perna, do you want to respond further to that? Thank you very much, Tom, for this. Thank you. OK, going to the next question, we're, we're going to go to a, a variety of live questions now. Um, the next question is from a student, Grath, forgive my pronunciation, Grathia Paramitha, um, and it's on the issue of extensions and criteria for extensions. Uh, Grathia, do you want to go ahead, please? And I hope I've pronounced your name correctly then. Thank you, I'm Gracia. Gracia, but, beg your pardon. Okay, uh, I've got a question. If a PhD student is going back home early and then writing thesis, but he or she cannot submit it on time due to communication issue or internet connection with supervisors and of course the COVID-19 issue or maybe mental illness, will it be possible to ask for deadline extension in that situation? And if possible, uh, if it's yes, will there be also a possible online fiber after the extension? Thank you. 
I think we're going to go to you, Juliet, on this question, please, first of all. Thank you. Yes, hi. Um, I, I would say absolutely on both counts. Um, you know, firstly, I think that the university recognises um, that, you know, this is this pandemic has um, affected um, people in, in a whole host of ways um, and that we need to be sympathetic to those and that um, the university has therefore looked at its um, requirements around extensions and particularly um, the evidence required and relaxed those rules so that it, you know that you don't have to provide evidence for example of, of how COVID-19 has impacted on you. Um, we would just ask you to you know to, to, to follow through the procedures that are set out on the website um, and make that request um, and explain what's happened and you'll be looked upon very sympathetically for an extension. So whether that's communication issues, caring responsibilities, um, health issues, mental health issues, whatever it is, the university will, will, will look very sympathetic, sympathetically on you in terms of granting an extension. And, and yes, absolutely, there's a, a process in place now for buyers to be held um, online. We've got um, a, a set of um, procedures in place um, so that everybody's um, experience is, is safeguarded and for example you can um, make sure you get some some training so that you feel comfortable in having an online viva um, and that you feel that you um, understand um, how that will will work so the information is all there on the web pages but if you if you having read that you've got any further questions then then just get in touch with us and we'll we'll help you um, we'll help answer any questions that you may have I think, Perna, you would like to raise a point on this as well, perhaps. Um, thank you very much for your question, Gracia. I, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your name right. So um, we are aware that um, a PhD journey is difficult as it is without a pandemic. And believe me, we had a quite number of heated debates at the university, especially in the PGR contingency group um, in terms of what other universities doing, what we can apply at the University of York. As GSA sabbatical offices, we wanted to see automatic extensions. And when we see that it didn't happen for certain reasons, we started to work on uh, criteria and requirements for these extensions. Um, I think one of the positive things coming out of this, uh, like in new extent, this new extension process for, for C19 time is ruling out the um, supervisor sign off because we, um, we have been contacted by several students stating that they would like to get an extension, but their supervisor um, like wants them to pro um, submit on time. So with this uh, removal of uh, supervisor signature, um, I'm certain that we kind of omitted, like uh, avoided that scenario. Um, yeah, thank you. Is there any f anything further, Clara? I think you wanted to raise a point there. Yeah, I just wanted uh, to not make a note on the extensions criteria because um, I think, uh, Everyone would know about, uh, right now, but uh, the the criteria for extensions has changed, and particular groups of students have been included. So I just wanted to mention that students with families and carers are now included into the criteria to ask for extensions. And it's also worth noticing that um, the request for evidence is not necessary now, so students will not be requested for evidence um, when asking for a. Um, a exceptional circumstances or leave of absence and you will not be asked for for evidence even after lockdown um so yeah i think this is worth making because not everyone is aware of it thank you clara um okay going on to the next question um from sarah lapaz i hope i pronounced that correctly uh, on the theme of there's a lot of guidance out there. We're all stuck in lockdown land, as it were, trying to stay um, busy and looking after our mental health and well-being. Some of you may have seen, of course, the Keep Home, uh, Keep Calm and Stay Home campaign that, that Clara and the GSA have led on, trying to provide an alternative, of course, to help you uh, stay safe and well while we're in lockdown. 
Um, but what should PGRs do during lockdown? I would urge you to look at that separately, by the way. Um, so Sarah, if you'd like to read out your question um, to the panel, please. Yes, hi. Um, and uh, my name was pronounced correctly. <laughs> um, yeah, so when will we as PGRs receive better guidance than, quote, now maybe the time to catch up with report writing or literature reviews that you've been putting off? It feels very belittling and ridicules our work and the impact this current crisis has on us, both professionally and privately. That's it. Okay, panel. Um, Karen, I think you would like to respond to this question. Yeah. Um, Sarah, I've consulted with colleagues and I think sometimes as a university we have to admit when we get things wrong. Um, and this is probably one of those occasions. I can understand um, that what you've just quoted is seen as, as insensitive. Um, and so for that, we apologise. It's, it's not what we meant. Um, sometimes as researchers, you write things and they don't come out quite as, as they intended. But what we mean, I, what we mean is use your most creative selves um, to think about what's possible at this time. So if epistemologically or methodologically, you're able to imagine different ways of conducting the research than you'd originally intended, now is probably the time to have that conversation with your supervisor and your TAP team. There are things that are possible that, um, that perhaps none of us thought of online and, and thinking creatively about how we approach things. So from a research perspective, I would urge you to think about what's possible um, and to have those conversations and just to imagine um, a different situation. That's, that's one option. The other option is being completely pragmatic um, with your supervisor and TAP team and saying, do you know what, I'm lab based. Um, the experiments simply can't be conducted in the way that they need to be conducted. There isn't another way of doing it that we think is feasible. And so that part of my research will have to go on hold. Um, and as you've heard, there are options then available to you for applying for extensions and applying for leaves of absence. Now, I'm pleased to say that yesterday um, we were able to communicate with, um, with departments and that communication will be coming to you directly soon, but you're hearing it now. If you are applying for a leave of absence because some of your work isn't possible, but you are well um, and you are comfortable in, in conducting some kind of, of work, then um, predictably from me, perhaps you might expect, I'm gonna suggest that you invest in your future and you take a reflective approach um, during this time to consider your career options, to conduct a training needs analysis, perhaps to write in a reflective way, think about your public engagement, think about writing for the conversation, Think about producing a video um, for us about your experiences of being a researcher during lockdown um, and what you're learning from those experiences. So if it's really not possible um, to do your research or, you know, your mental state is such that you, you're just not feeling entirely engaged and, and we get that. We're all having days where um, we're taking part in displacement activities or we're going for a walk or we're just acknowledging that our head's not in the right space for doing um, the, the complex piece of work that we need to do. And so we're doing something else. And so keeping writing in any shape or form is going to be really helpful um, for you at this time, whether that's reflective, whether that's diary based, whether that's blog, um, whether it's writing for publication, whether it's with your consent of your uh, an approval from your supervisor, it's picking up an aspect of your research um, that perhaps was going to be a conference paper um, and is tangential to the main point of your research, but which will give you an avenue um, and a focus, then all of those options, I think, are, are available to you. Um, and the other thing I think to remember, and, and here um, I am at risk of being sounding patronizing, but it isn't intended. Give yourself some time out, um, you know, give yourself some space to, um, to just recalibrate, uh, to just, you know, take stock of where you are, do the essential online conversations with family and friends, um, and think seriously about what it is that you want to get out of this time. 
because we're all learning new skills. Um, we're all ten taking part in in training and getting to grips with uh, with online methods of delivery. And um, you know, there's there's a lot of training out there. My team are working flat out to get interactive, interesting uh, training available to you. Everything that you see on Skills Forge is available. Um, do, do, do something different and do what you're comfortable with at the moment. Um, and I think that's the most honest answer that we can, we can give to you at the moment. But you know, don't put undue pressure on yourselves. Um, be realistic about what you can do. I hope that helps a bit. Harold, um, can I think... just make a brief comment? Yep. So, so I, I just wanted to, a, a brief explainer, you know, a little explainer box. Uh, Karen mentioned leaves of absence in, in that reply. And um, I just want to just make sure everyone understands the difference between a leave of absence and an extension and the different purposes of those and, and how they work. Um, so a, a leave of absence, as we call it, other places call it a suspension of registration is when you're not, for, for whatever reason, you're not able to carry on with your degree program. You can take it from any degree, but for a postgraduate researcher, it's typically you're not able to carry on with your research. And you're taking a break, effectively. For, and they can be granted for all sorts of reasons. And generally, that's a very low threshold. Um, we'd much rather you take a break and then come back ready to carry on. So a leave of absence is effective, can be any number of months uh, that you need. And we would advise, and um, there can be complexities with funding and things, but we would advise you, uh, if you, if you really are struggling, uh, to think about that option and to discuss it with your supervisor in your department. Uh, an extension is something slightly different. An extension is saying, uh, it's not that you need a break, it's that you need more time to do things and those, those are slightly different thoughts and um, that's why extensions get granted towards the end in the final stages of your uh, of your degree program whereas leaves of absence you can take at any point so that's just a kind of a clarification on that and sick leave is also a leave of absence so uh, illness is a very good reason for a leave of absence um, Someone did ask a question about wholly retrospective. You, if, you, if you do read our policies carefully, we stick the odd normally into, uh, into our policies at various points. We say, normally you can't take a wholly retrospective leave of absence. Um, these are not normal times. So these are the, the, these are the times where we're making uh, exceptional decisions. Um, and so ask for what you need and, uh, and that's that's the way forward thank you tom for um taking that moment to uh, clarify um i think clara might have wanted to come in there clara um, yeah. on the well-being side of things yeah thank you Laura. i just wanted to acknowledge this time to also notice that a lot of students are put on under a huge amount of pressure uh, during this time. I think we, we as a student union recognize that they are being asked to basically continue with their studies. Uh, and sometimes the feeling of being productive during this time can be very overwhelming. And I think we're all the ones that are working and the ones doing research uh, can feel this. So I just want to um, say again that anyone that can afford to ask for an exceptional circumstances and leave of absence, uh, please, make sure that you take uh, the possibilities that the university is handing to you. Um, I know that not everyone is available, uh, is, is, is open, uh, like not everyone can ask uh, for leave of absence or exceptional circumstances, for, but for the ones that do, uh, please consider it because this is at the moment the most effective uh, resource that we have. I, I hope that gives you a, a comprehensive answer for now, Sarah. Do you have a, any response at all? Is that helpful? Thank you. I, thank you to all of you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, moving on then uh, to the next question. Uh, we have a question from Catherine Rose Hailstone on the issue of university hiring PGRs. Uh, Catherine, would you like to go ahead, please? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear um, you. 
Okay, well, thank you all for giving up your time to talk to us today. Um, I'd like to ask, would it be possible to have some clarity on when the university intends to remove its hiring freeze to allow its various departments to issue casual contracts again, please? And I'm thinking about this in relation to postgraduates who teach, postgraduates who hold um, jobs that require casual contracts in other areas of the university besides teaching as well. A lot of us require those for our income right now. <laughs> like, when are they going to be available again? That's that's a difficult question. Yes, I think I think Karen, you're going to want to answer this question, aren't you? Yeah, thanks, Catherine. I um, completely understand where where you're coming from, and we tried to get as much clarity as as we can um, on this. Obviously, things things that are changing. Um, so I'll start with the good news is um, that from next academic year, the university um, won't be putting GTAs, graduate teaching assistants, um, on the casual payroll. They will be issued with, um, with conventional contracts of employment, which will give uh, a, a little bit more security. For now, the situation um, is, uh, and I'm, I'm, we'll be as honest as we can here, uh, because we don't know what the situation is vis-a-vis -vis students um, coming coming in and the numbers of students coming in, it's very difficult for departments to identify how many teaching staff they're going to need um, and how many GTAs. So moving forward, um, it is in a little bit of a, a flux at the moment to get any real clear idea of how many GTAs will be needed. I think, you know, departments will make best, best sensible guesses. Um, about people who are needed to, to teach on modules and, and uh, et cetera. Obviously those who are demonstrating in labs will be, will be a slightly trickier question to, um, to be asking of themselves. Uh, for the moment, uh, there, isn't, there, there is a freeze, um, but at the moment you are as a GTA on a casual contract and there is a, a limit that, um, that the departments have a discretion to be, to be using in employing those. So it isn't that all GTA uh, contracts are cancelled, it's that uh, an extensive um, use of those casual contracts um, is, is restricted. And that's entirely because um, of the, the frugality needed um, in relation to the amount of money that obviously is being lost by the university and, and the tricky financial situation that York and all universities are in at the moment. So we're trying to be very sensible about where um, cuts can be made. But I, I can assure you um, that there will be no cuts made around the quality of teaching um, and the quality of the student experience. It is in the university and um, it, it, written into our DNA to provide a good quality student experience. So where a GTA is being used to provide good quality learning experiences and support um, and there is good need for those to go ahead, then departments will use their discretion to use the budgets that they've got um, to make those. And as I say, from next year, um, you won't be on casual contracts, you'll be on um, more secure um, contracts of employment. So um, I hope that gives you a little bit of clarity. That's genuinely the the best intelligence that we have um, at the moment and I would urge you uh, to respectfully go and, and speak to your department and see what position they're in um, to either assure you of, of a continuation at the moment or to give you a, a sense of um, you know when, when they might be able to make those decisions when, when they've got intel on the students coming in next year but that's, that's how the land lies at the moment. Um, thank you for that detailed response, Karen. I, I know for myself that this is an area that the GSA sabbaticals here have passionately lobbied on. Uh, I think all of them want to speak on this, actually. So um, I think we'll start off with Clara. Would you like to, what, to comment, Clara? Thank you, um, Daryl. I just wanted to say that uh, we welcome the initiative of the university. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to highlight that um, 
before lockdown, the university signed a commitment with the campus unions, with United Unison and UCU, uh, for the use of open-ended contracts in order to provide additional reassurance. Uh, and they have committed to secure postgraduate students on GTA contracts. And I think as, as a postgraduate union, we are really pleased to see that, that change happening, um, especially after the year of the strikes that we've been <laughs> um, going through. So, yeah, thank you. And, and Perna, would you like to go ahead, please? Or is it, sorry, um, Jane, I beg your pardon. That's all right. Yeah, um, I think just again, we're really, really pleased with this announcement. Um, and also you mentioned as well, um, people that are working um, in other areas that are not GTAs. Obviously, there's um, a current hiring freeze. We don't currently know when it's going to end. Um, but for GTAs, we're really pleased with the announcement. Um, and we look forward to um, working with the, the campus unions and HR on it as well. And Perna, do you have anything further to add? Um, just a point to say that GTRs are a crucial part of uh, York's academic life and contracting them um, will acknowledge their like value. And I really welcome that. Thank you, Daryl. Can I just um, put in a word, Daryl? Yeah, yeah, go for it, Tom. Thanks. So I, I just want to say two things. So one, one of the first decisions that the university made uh, when we realised that we were going to have to close the campus this term, was that all GTAs who had been assigned work this summer term would be paid for that, whether or not it was possible for them to do the work. So there is a very deep commitment to supporting our GTAs. But also I want to say one other thing that people often don't realise um, is that you're not restricted to working as a GTA in your own department. If there is GTA work in other departments which you're capable and, and qualified of delivering, you can apply for that work as well. And this may be really important next year because we don't know how many students there are going to be, but we also don't know where they're going to fall across the university. Some departments may find they've got more than they expected, others fewer. So if you are a GTA and you think I might be able to teach or demonstrate in, a, in a, another department, make sure you look out for work in those other departments as well. Thank you, Tom. Um, we've got about eight minutes left. Uh, we're seeing lots of comments from all of you out there. We're gonna try and cover as many as we can. Um, we have uh, a question, um, I believe from Clara, one of our GSA sabbatical officers. Would you like to go ahead, please, Clara? Um, yes, thank you, Daryl. Uh, I just wanted to say that we've been receiving quite um, a lot of questions in the union uh, about free, uh, continuation fees. So just wanted to ask if the university is going to waive their continuation fees, if they are going, if they are thinking about it or, or what are the plans on it? Thanks, Clara. Shall I take that one? Yeah. So first thing I would just want to say, no one has been charged a continuation fee in this calendar year in 2020. OK, um, that that's the situation we're at uh, at present. What we we are doing is um, it's actually uh, in final stages and hopefully we're able to make an announcement next week about the exact details of how we're going to have make sure that those who are affected by the pandemic in a way which would trigger a continuation fee um, will not have to pay it. So effectively no fee extensions. Currently, um, you wouldn't pay a continuation fee for a three month extension anyway. Um, so uh, we, it will only be when we see larger impacts than that, um, that it'll, it, it will be relevant. But we are um, uh, currently hoping to announce that uh, early next week. Thank you for that clarification, Tom. Um, Perna, did you want to raise anything further on that issue? I think um, Tom has already summed up it um, quite well. Um, we, we have been aware of the financial impact of seeing, uh, seeing COVID-19 on students. And like we have been, we have been having these discussions on the continuation fees and how, um, like the possibility of waiving them. So looking forward to the announcement. Fantastic. Okay, um, moving on quickly then uh, in the remaining time. We have a question uh, provided to us anonymously. Um, will PhD students get a safety net like undergraduates? Um, who would like to go ahead with this one first? Tom? I think I better. So 
some of you may be aware that there's an undergraduate safety net for people who uh, are progressing or graduating this year and also taught uh, postgraduate students, taught master's students have had their uh, had the criteria for awards of merits and distinctions changed. So people sometimes say, should we do something with the PhD? Um, and this has been an active area of discussion. And actually it's something that we wouldn't want to do unilaterally as an institution. So it is something I've been discussing with deans of graduate schools around the country. And we do have regular meetings. Uh, and this has been a topic. And the, the general consensus is that um, the, the standards for a PhD don't need to be changed. And actually, it wouldn't be a good thing. I mean, a, a PhD is a PhD, uh, and it needs to stay that, that way. Um, and so we're not going to be changing um, the criteria for, the, for, for, being, for passing your PhD. However, we know that um, examiners have a lot of uh, discretion in how they respond to a, to a PhD thesis and what's in it. And this is very, very discipline specific. It can also be project specific. So if you are coming up to submit your PhD now or possibly sometime in the future, and the pandemic forced you to, to do something different, perhaps you weren't able to collect as much data, perhaps you weren't, weren't able to, to address a particular issue, then please, what we're recommending is that you should um, include that information in the appropriate place in your thesis. It might be in a preface, it might be in your methods chapter, it depends on the discipline. But the examiners need to know that if, you, if your thesis isn't the sort of thesis you'd hope to write because of the pandemic, then let the examiners know and they, they will be able to, to uh, take that into account in the process. So, so that's where we've got to with that. Um, and as I say, it's a pretty much, uh, it's a national discussion and uh, we're, we're aligning with everyone else. Okay, I'm gonna have to quickly uh, move on to the last question. We've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, the last question we can um, answer, try and answer. What will happen to research field trips in the UK? Will these still go ahead? Are we coming back to you, Tom? Or any comments from the GSA? Karen, well? can you answer that briefly? Bearing in mind we've got two minutes. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm afraid um, we can't provide any kind of magic bullet on this. We, we are really um, betrothed to, to whatever the government say is possible. So, um, you know, once the borders are lifted and once the government says that it's safe to travel, then if your field work is, is out of the country, then that becomes manageable. Um, and if it's within this country, then we have to follow all the guidelines on social distancing. So again, um, it, you know, it's, it's doing within the confines of, um, of what the government permits and, and which it sets as, as very sensible guidelines that, that we have to follow. And this, you know, the university will just follow those guidelines. It's, it, you know, it's not perfect. We know that, but, but we have to do um, in the interest of, of safety, both of yourselves and anybody that, that you're involving in field work. So, um, we, you know, we will follow those guidelines and let you know as soon as we're able. Thank you, Karen. Um, Daryl, can I just make a comment in response to some questions that have been coming up that we haven't asked, yeah, answered? Yeah. Um, so there have been quite a few questions raised about the unclarity in the VC's email last week about which PhD students uh, were being regarded as eligible. Um, yeah, I'm really, as Karen said, we can make mistakes. Uh, everyone can make mistakes. And in, particularly at the moment, things are moving fast and we're under a lot of pressure. And it seems that that email was unclear and there will be a further clarification. I, um, and that will come from, from uh, in the same way. Um, but uh, rest assured that while, as I've been saying earlier, what we're currently offering is extensions to people in their final year of funding we're not going to forget about uh, the other students. It's just, we'll deal with those issues as they, as they arise. And, and you, if you've still got several years of funding left, you don't, we don't want to make a decision about 
that when we've got so much uncertainty. Uh, we'll deal with that nearer the time. Is there anything uh, any of the GSA subs would like to uh, comment on finally before we have to leave? No? Okay, I'm just going to summarise very quickly then. Um, first of all, thanks to all the students out there that have taken the time to join us today. Um, thank you to the panellists. Uh, we hope that the information provided has been uh, useful to you. Um, from the GSA perspective, we're really keen to to reach and support as many students as we can with the information available. It's not always easy to find. That's part of the reason why we're doing this format today. All of us would really value your input on whether this has been uh, useful to you. If it has, we'd like to see how we might develop it further, but it is an experiment. So uh, be kind with your feedback, but um, difficult questions. We are keen to uh, keep making sure you get the information you need, what's available. So contact us at the GSA, contact the research school with any feedback on the format. Also, if there's any specific individual points we couldn't address, by all means, contact the GSA subs individually. The details are at our website, yourgsa.org. Um, I would say that all the questions we've uh, answered, all the questions we received will be put on to the Graduate Research School web, web pages. Uh, we'll provide a link at the GSA. Um, and we will, we will make sure that all questions we didn't get to ask at the time will be uh, listed as well. Further to that, the GSA sabbatical officers will continue in their series of Q&A vlogs. So please check the website for more details. And we hope to cover some of the questions raised here today that weren't answered in the time we had. Um, and lastly, I would summarise by saying that if there are issues that you do feel passionate about away from your studies, if, you are, if this is a good moment for you, then do consider yourself for nominate, nominating yourself as a candidate for the GSA elections uh, 2020. Uh, forgive the shameless plug, the nominations close tomorrow. Um, the GSA is here, uh, passionately lobbying on your behalf, and hopefully uh, you might consider getting involved. Uh, nominations by end of midnight, please. But yeah, any feedback on today, anything further we can do to support and share this information in the most productive way, please get in contact. But um, thanks again and um, stay safe. Thank you, bye-bye.